All right, well, let's get started then. My name is David Maas, I'm a professor of pediatrics at uh, Stanford uh, University and going to uh, talk a little about early CGM start in type 1 diabetes and want to thank the Dream Med uh, team for inviting me to, to present and uh, looking forward to uh, maybe a, a 20, 25 minute talk here and then some time for uh, discussion at the end. And let's see, we will get things going here. Just disclosures here. And then uh, just to start out, um, I think there's been a, a paradigm shift in how uh, in the relationship of A1C to severe hypoglycemia um, that the data since the, the days of the DCCT where there was um, a great increase in severe hypoglycemia, the lower the A1C was, um, that that's uh, changed, that we are able to get um, lower A1Cs without as much severe hypoglycemia. Um, many reasons for that, including improved education um, and, and many others as well. Um, and I, I do think also that there uh, clearly has been improved diabetes technology and treatments. And uh, one question for this uh, presentation and discussion afterwards is, should there then also be a paradigm shift in how we provide diabetes education? Um, and what is that role for early diabetes education? I think we still have a, uh, patients still have a, a fear of hypoglycemia and that that's a significant barrier to tight glucose control. Um, and also, of course, uh, quality of life is very important uh, for our patients as well as, as uh, glucose metrics. So just to start out a little bit on, on CGM, how far have we come briefly, and then where are we, show some recent data, and then uh, focus on where uh, we think we should go, and, and I think that'll be the focus of our discussion at the end. So this is a slide that um, I uh, borrowed from Dr. Peter Chase at Barbara Davis Center, um, and he um, lived through these different eras where there was monitoring of glucose in, in urine, and then uh, glucose meters um, continue to be important, um, but in the last decade or so, we've really seen an increase in the amount of continuous glucose monitors. And of course, then uh, with the future of uh, automated insulin delivery systems. And so this is an old slide um, just showing uh, from Dr. Chase again, just showing that uh, with glucose meters, we're able to get snapshots of what uh, blood glucose is doing. But then with a continuous glucose monitor, you have more of a movie and, uh, and more data um, in between meals or in between times when you might be checking a, a blood glucose. So vastly more information that you can get from continuous glucose monitors to use um, to have better glucose control. And over the, the years, and this uh, slide stops in about 2015, and, and um, accuracy of sensors has continued to improve, but just showing that, that really um, the, the CGMs are, are fairly comparable to the self-monitored blood glucose on uh, the glucose meters. So where are we now? Um, and just going to look at um, some data on how much CGM is being used. And then I think the big question is, can CGM help people with diabetes achieve their goals? And some of those would be uh, glucose related, lower A1C, more time and range. We'll talk a little about that at the end. Less hypoglycemia. Also then quality of life. Uh, we want the diabetes technology to uh, reduce the burden of care and for people to have less worry. And then another topic we'll touch on a little bit is uh, the question of will diabetes technology then increase disparities in outcome? And in the US, at least, we've got uh, challenges with public insurance and for some of these diabetes technologies um, to get covered. So these are data from the type 1 diabetes exchange, just showing how CGM use has increased um, in, the, in the past decade. And we'll show some uh, more recent data um, publications. Uh, later. The, these are data, again, from the T1D exchange from 2010 in the orange line, um, and uh, then the blue line, and this was published by Nicole Foster in, in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics, and just showing that the 2016-18 data that actually the A1Cs uh, increased, especially in the, uh, in the adolescent and young adult population. Now, in a paper that just came out uh, online in DTT by Kelly Miller, um, she uh, looked at, at these uh, data from the T1D exchange in 2016-18 in a little more detail 
uh, looking at it multiple different ways, but uh, the one I wanted to show for the purpose of this talk is just these similar curves, but then looking at A1C across the lifespan and those who were uh, did not use CGM versus those who did use CGM. And you can see that there was a, a fair gap there um, with lower achieved A1Cs. And of course, this is observational data, um, but showing that there, there was lower A1C among those who were using CGM. And there could be many reasons for that. Another, um, another set of data um, that came out recently is from Jeremy Pettis. And this, these data are in adults. Um, but we see the curve from the T1D exchange here from the 2016-18 data. And then what this group did was um, looked at electronic health records um, and over 30,000 uh, people uh, with type 1 diabetes in that you can see that there are in this group who weren't uh, necessarily being seen in diabetes centers. There, was, there were even higher A1Cs in this population. So concerning that there, there may be uh, the outcomes for uh, A1C in, in the US um, may be even worse than what we're seeing with the, the T1D exchange, um, and clearly indicating that we've got more, more work we need to do to, to improve the care we provide. So I've focused on, on glucose control so far, um, but I think it's also important to, to keep in mind that, uh, and these are slides from Corey Hood and Deanna Naranjo, diabetes psychologists I work with, that it's, it's very important that um, we try to have more support and less burden. And historically, um, some of the uh, technologies that we've advocated for patients to use have actually increased the burden. Um, and we need to reverse that. We need to reduce the burden and we need to increase the support um, to make these um, devices easier for people to use and to get better outcomes. And so again, another slide from uh, Dr. Hood Naranjo um, with this um, conception of uh, with the devices, obviously we have to tell our patients about them. We also need th that they have realistic expectations and the problem solving skills to use these. And then the goals being increased time and target as well as redu reduce cognitive burden. And so I think uh, we are getting to that point um, as you can see uh, with the increased uptake of, of CGM use in, in patient population. So just a little bit want to talk about access and equity because I think these are important points as well. And so these are our data that Kelly Miller again uh, presented at ESPE in 2018 and uh, just came out this, uh, this month in diabetes care. These are joint data from the type 1 diabetes exchange um, and the DPV registry in uh, Germany and Austria. And in this panel just showing that over time from 2011, 13, 15 to 17, whether you look at it by six-year-olds, six to less than six-year-olds, excuse me, six to 13-year-olds or 13 to 18-year-olds, there's been an increase in CGM use in the T1D exchange. And then similarly in DPV, um, a more dramatic increase in, in 2015 um, and actually uh, higher use than, um, than in the US. Now, one of the points also made with these data is that when you look in the T1D exchange, among uh, minority um, youth that there is uh, lower uptake of CGM, um, slightly um, uh, lower in uh, DPV when you looked at uh, the variable called migration history. And this is important that people are getting access um, to CGM because again, um, as we see the, the A1Cs achieved by people using uh, CGM are lower than those who, who do not use it. So I just want to uh, briefly show a paper that one of my colleagues, uh, Priya Prahalad at Stanford, um, published in VTT now about a year and a half ago. And what she did was just look at the first 40 patients that we had in our clinic who had public insurance. And it was a challenge to get CGM use approved um, for, their, uh, for their use. And um, they continued to use it um, and uh, maintained a reasonable A1C. We didn't have pre-data. Um, on time and range, um, but their A1C stayed steady and they had less than 4% uh, of time um, with a uh, glucose less than 70. And just concluding that um, I think stating the obvious here, there's no reason to believe that people with lower socioeconomic status behave differently than people with more substantial means and use of CGM. And then again, I think stating the obvious, as diabetes technology becomes more effective, it's important that all people with type 1 diabetes are able to benefit. 
So just moving on to last part of the talk here, you know, where do we need to go? And I think this is uh, what we should uh, discuss in our time at the end. Um, I would say that all patients with type one should have access to CGM. Um, I think we need to keep working to get data to uh, demonstrate improved outcomes, to improve informed guidelines and payers, um, government agencies, whoever it is who's providing these, um, paying for these. I think also we have an opportunity to improve education for CGM, to be able to better use these systems for tighter control. I think we can improve, uh, these can help improve quality of life. And I think also what we've talked about on access to these is, is really important that everyone should benefit. And I showed you some data from uh, our institution locally, but also the suite uh, registry uh, internationally um, has shown that uh, or what they conclude in this paper, I, I won't uh, read all the abstract for you, but their conclusion is that although innovative diabetes, diabetes technology is available, a large proportion of children with type one still do not benefit from it due to its limited reimbursement. So this is a, a worldwide challenge that not all of the patients we would like to have access to this are able to get access. So one question is uh, right now, we wouldn't think about sending a patient home uh, from uh, diagnosis without a, a glucose meter, as you can see over here. Um, these are just some of the meters out of our, our closet in our clinic. Um, but my question is, at what point do we um, then say we're, we're going to send you home with a continuous glucose meter? And we see the three different uh, brands that we have right there. So I think that that's a question, how soon after diagnosis should we be starting these systems? And so these are data um, from uh, Corey Hood, um, at Stanford and Paul Wadwa at the Barbara Davis Center, and, and these were um, presented at ATTV last year, just showing that in a group um, that they started CGM in the first month, um, that there was um, decreased uh, time below 70, both at three months and at six months. Um, just one example of how, um, how CGM started early um, had improvement, at least in, in hypoglycemia metrics. So another um, study, and this was uh, just uh, came out um, actually in, uh, in the January issue of um, Diabetes Care. Um, Priya Prahalad at, at our institution um, started 46, we had 46 new onsets, 41 of them got started. Um, of the five who didn't get started, um, two, um, two lived, uh, were diagnosed locally but lived abroad and then three did not want uh, to wear something on their body. And, and so these 41 patients were started at a, a mean um, of nine days after diagnosis, started on CGM. Of those 41, 38 continued. Two um, stopped because their insurance wouldn't continue to pay for it. And one was a teenager who uh, stated they didn't want something on their body. So in the 14 days prior to their most recent visit, um, they were wearing it over 90% of the time. They were getting achieving about 70% of their time in range and had um, about 3% of their time uh, below 70. So with the public insurance that I talked about, we weren't able to start everyone on these systems early because they um, wouldn't then get them approved to be able to continue to use it. However, since we've uh, uh, written this um, initial group up, we have been able to get funding locally so that we're able to, to start all of our new onset patients and, and we will be writing that up and, and I hope presenting data on that um, in the next year. Um, again, to make the case that everyone, uh, all children with type one should be able to benefit from continuous glucose monitors. So just uh, briefly, and this uh, is uh, already outdated, um, with the uh, Diabetes Technology ADA Standards of Care. The first one came out in 2019, and then just in the last couple of weeks, the 2020 um, Standards of Care for Diabetes Technology came out um, and uh, still need more data. This is B-level data for um, real-time CGM use in, in, uh, in youth. And um, the ISBAD guidelines came out in 2018 with very similar um, recommendations as well. Um, that uh, CGM can help lower A1C, reach target A1C, reduce glucose variability, and increase time and range in the pediatric population. Also, I hope everyone's aware of this paper that came out in Diabetes Care 
Um, Tade Badalino is the first author among others um, and um, basically came out with time and range consensus uh, recommendations. And some of those being that uh, try to aim for 70% of the time between 70 and 180, less than 4% of the time below 70, and of that less than 1% of the time below 54. And so some simple numbers that I'll use with patients <clears throat> are to try to aim for a mean glucose of 150, try to aim for 70% of the time in range of 70 to 180, less of 4% of the time less than, than 70, and, and less than 1% of the time less than 54. So these are some simple numbers that, that people can use. And if you're tracking there, your A1C um, is uh, going to track as well around the 7% range. And again, just uh, to uh, make sure people are aware of some of the more recent hypoglycemia definitions came out the International um, Hypoglycemia Working Group. Um, and I think these have been adopted. Um, these are from uh, the ISPAD hypoglycemia um, guidelines, but just uh, some of the phrasing of this I think is important um, to um, perhaps how we teach people about hypoglycemia I think can be important and make an impact. Um, and the way these are phrased is less than 70 is considered a clinical hypoglycemia alert um, and that it's an alert value that requires attention to prevent hypoglycemia. And then less than 54 is considered a clinically important or serious hypoglycemia. Um, it indicates serious clinically important hypoglycemia. And then a severe hypoglycemia is an event um, that's associated with severe cognitive impairment, such as coma and convulsions. So there also have been advances in hypoglycemia treatment that I think are important. Um, we have had in the last um, few months, um, the Baxemi um, that has been developed, so the intranasal glucagon that works quite well and is much more simple than the seven steps um, that went into the old systems. Um, and then also the Juvoc um, pen. So we've got two new options that are uh, markedly more uh, easy for patients to use than, um, than the old seven step um, red kits that we had. So where are we going? Well, I think um, there are a lot of advances being made. This is from a review paper that one of my colleagues, uh, Priya Prahalad wrote in diabetic medicine. I think we're, we're clearly moving ahead with diabetes technology, patient reported outcomes are very important. Um, we're making a lot of progress in telehealth and teleeducation. Uh, electronic medical records, um, benchmarking quality improvement. There's lots of opportunity for big data and then partnerships um, to improve care. So I did not talk much about artificial pancreases, but clearly this is, this is where we're going. This is a, a paper from uh, Dr. Philip and, and uh, colleagues at Dream Med. Um, and this was the, the first one that came out, I believe in 2000, um, 2013, I believe, uh, someone can correct me on that. Um, and you can see then with um, additional papers coming out, this is um, Roman Aborka's group, um, Boris Kovachev's group, there have been others, um, and this most recent one came out. And we see with all of these papers, increasingly uh, tighter glucose control and um, that these systems have gone from um, hospital settings to hotel settings to camp settings to uh, home use and um, progressively longer periods of time. So it's, it's clear to me that um, this will be um, increasingly part of the way we provide care to people with type 1 diabetes. So in summary, we, we have new glucagon formulations that I think will be very helpful for patients. There's been a rapid increase in the use of CGM. This has been associated with lower A1C, less hypoglycemia, and reducing burden. I think we have opportunities to improve how we do CGM education. And then soon, if not already, um, I think CGM will be the main method to monitor glucose in our patients with type one. <laughs> I think the question is still open, how soon do we start these? I do worry that we some of the barriers to access um, could widen disparities. And we're looking into some data on that to try to advocate for um, better access for all. And obviously the CGMs are an essential component of closed loop systems. Um, and in my opinion, those are the, the future that we have with, um, with glucose control and uh, very promising. And we, work will continue to be done to make those better. And I think also to bring those to a, a broader group of people. 
So with that, um, we will um, stop and I think open things up for any questions. Um, and let me see if, make sure, um, we are able to do questions now. Aaron, I don't know if you're able to. There we go. Okay, people are unmuted now. So would welcome any any questions in the next few minutes. And one last point on. Um, on the slide here, there's a uh, website um, that uh, Corey Hood and others have put together um, that is designed to help um, patients uh, sort through the different types of, of uh, technology that's available out there, and, and particularly with uh, glucose sensors. So would be uh, pleased to take any, any uh, questions or if there are discussions or uh, points that other people would like to make, um, the floor is open. Uh, okay, so it looks like a couple of questions have come in. Um, one from uh, Kim Krapek. Um, is there additional assessment done at their first appointment following new diagnosis that identifies those who do best initiating CGM? Um, so that's a great question. I think uh, we need to have more data on that. Um, we're in the process of uh, trying to, uh, to get more data on that by having more um, quality of life questionnaires that we give out um, to families. We do have some data that we'll be presenting at the ADA uh, this year, I hope, um, if it's accepted, showing uh, the sustained use of, of CGM. Um, but then we'll, we also want to have some quality of life um, data as well. And um, I think the fact that 90 to 95 percent of patients have continued to use the CGM indicates that that they like it, but it would be nice to have more, more granular data on that. Um, so I think that's an area that we need to do more work on. And I think there, we've had some patients um, who either because um, they already had a family member or a parent had type one diabetes that um, they, they were wanting to start the CGM very early, maybe uh, in the first couple of days. We've had others that uh, weren't ready um, in the first few weeks, but then it started later. So I think um, clearly it, it does need to be individualized, but we've been trying to start in the first week or two, um, depending on logistics for the family and, and the uh, care team. So another question from uh, Stephanie Decker, um, is there a readiness assessment form that can identify which patient's families may be more appropriate to initiate CGM earlier, early after diagnosis? Um, I think that that's a great question, and I think that would be um, a wonderful tool to develop. I'm not aware of such a tool. Um, is anyone anyone on on the uh, webinar aware of such a tool? And I, I am taking that since no one's responding, that no one's aware of that. Um, and then here's another one. How can everyday healthcare providers help to sway insurance providers? Medi-Cal um, Medi is the, the California public insurance in particular to adopt the use of CGM more quickly given the results are so positive. Um, I think that's, that's a great question. I think um, we all need to be advocating um, I wonder if some of the uh, organizations like the American Diabetes Association, JDRF, uh, can, can also help us um, advocate 
Um, so I, I think that may be um, an opportunity. Um, let's see. Anyone else have thoughts on that, how we can be helping advocate? I think my, my thought is to get more, more data and, um, and be making, making the outcomes clear and, uh, and, and lobbying uh, those groups to uh, make sure that they understand the benefit that our patients get from this, uh, these, these life-changing these, uh, life changing technologies. All right, two other questions um, here. It, uh, one from uh, Dr. Nimri. Um, do you recommend a particular CGM brand to different people? Um, and uh, in, in general, uh, my approach is to explain what the different um, diabetes technologies can do, um, what the pros and cons are, and, um, and then uh, let the, the families um, decide. Um, I think also in the U.S. we have uh, challenges with um, insurances covering certain um, certain technologies and maybe not others or um, certain brands versus one versus the other. Um, another, what type of educational materials have you found to be most helpful when starting starting CGM? What materials are needed? Um, we've developed some some basic um, materials um, locally. Um, I think the, the companies have, have materials as well. Um, so I, I think I, I, there's no one, one type necessarily that I'd, I'd recommend, but I do think it's really important um, that, that we provide uh, good education and that people understand what they're, what they're getting started on. Um, All right, well, it looks like we're at, um, at 9.30. All right, we've got one more comment here. One thing that can help with payers is data evidence of sustained use. Uh, improvement in clinical outcome is important, but sustained use as well. So very good, very good point, Kim. Um, all right, well, we are at our 30 minute time period. I'm not sure if anyone from the Dream Med uh, team is on, if they have any comments. All right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap it up and uh, thank you all for um, for calling in today and and uh, hope you have a, a good day. Thank you.